Welcome. I'm really excited to have Hillary Ramo here today, and I'm excited to talk with you. So you are a woman of many talents, I see. I, you know, I see that you are a photographer, a painter, you're a writer, you're an author of three books, and you have a radio um, show. So it's like, my question to you is this, out of all those things, what is most passionate? What are you most passionate about? Oh, most passionate. I have to choose one. Well, I think what happens for me is I just follow my bliss and it's led me to a lot of interesting places. And being an artist gives me the opportunity to use different mediums in my art. And photography just happens to be one of those mediums. If I get approached and say, oh, you're a photographer, can I hire you for my wedding? I go, no, because what I mostly do is I'm out there in nature. I do a lot of nature work. So I'm out walking the woods. I, I just enjoy it. It's very meditative for me. So uh, in 2014, I did a two-year project where I gathered people from all around the world, and I used social media to do this. And we would do what's called a love breathe for earth meditation. We did about 13 of these. And we would just get together on one day, find a place out in nature that we felt comfortable and wanted to sit and meditate in. And then we would conjure our feelings of love, whatever that meant for each person. And we would just sit there and meditate on that and let the feeling kind of grow into our environment around us. And people seem to really respond really well to that. And then... What I started to do from that point forward was document these beautiful places in nature where I was meditating. And I started to document our journey. And I, of course, I was on the air. I started radio in 2005. And so I was already broadcasting and had been for quite a while. But I was traveling for work and I was traveling for personal reasons. And I would find these outdoor meditation spots. And then I would turn around and photograph them. And it kind of became a collection of sorts and then I realized I really liked doing it and then I started to paint some of the paintings some of them became paintings for me and I started to paint them and what it it kind of just grew a life of its own and became something else and someone said to me one day well you should show your pictures and I had never even thought about that before so I started to go through albums and albums of photography that I had saved from all of these different journeys and put together um a collection of sorts that I could put out and, and the response was really overwhelmingly positive. So I just went with what works. <laughs> I'm starting to, it's working, I do it. And for the last four years, I've been showing my work in local venues. I've been in some galleries in New York City and I've worked with a lot of artists and I'm the president of our local art association now. And so I help over 120, 130 different artists here locally get their voices and their their work out. You know, not everybody knows how to get their stuff out there. And I realized rather quickly that's a skill that most people need to learn somehow or get confidence with. And so it led into all the things. And so all the things that I do may seem unrelated. However, they're all connected somehow, some way. And I always tell everybody, well, I don't work. I just do what I love. And I just go with it. And then sometimes it makes me money and sometimes it doesn't. Right. Um, That's actually fascinating that, you know, everything you do, like it morphs into something else. And, um, you know, my question is probably with all these things that you have going on, you know, what do you, like, if you look back at everything you did, what would probably be the one thing um, that you wish you knew when you started out? Oh, what do I wish I knew back then? <laughs> I wish I knew back then how to more authentically enjoy myself. Mm. What does that mean? Well, it means that at 47 years old, I'm completely comfortable with myself in ways that I wasn't 20 years ago. I think we, women especially go through stages of comfort and they go through phases where they feel beautiful or they feel um, unworthy. You know, we go through all of these different things, especially in business. You know, we go through stages in, in our rise up through the work world where we feel, I believe, a lot, I'm not trying to speak for everybody, but I, think I have seen this be pretty consistent. My background is in insurance and real estate and business and contractual stuff and studying cryptocurrencies. And so that seems really different than artwork and photography and those things. However, it keeps both sides of my brain happy. 
And in doing that, I've discovered that your talents don't have to necessarily lie in one thing. Your talent can be your ability to show up anywhere and be able to uh, have a, a valuable input into whatever's, whatever you're doing. So that's what I try to do. I try to take everything as a mindful exercise, you know, whether I'm sitting down at a table to do a planning meeting for the board or if I'm trying to decide and curate a show, it really has all the same mindfulness elements for me. And it's all practice. And my spiritual beliefs are a hodgepodge of different things because I've been exposed to a lot of different things over the course of my life. I was raised Quaker, so we were already in a room meditating when I was a child and I had no idea I was meditating. I didn't even know we were meditating until I got older and realized what Quakers really do. And then I started to find my way to, to indigenous cultures and photographing, you know, indigenous cultures and getting into how they see the world and their world cosmology. As a radio host, I traveled extensively. I've been to, I was, went through a period where I was really passionate about megalithic structures, Stonehenge, different things around the world. I've uh, been to Giza four times. I've actually physically touched those pyramids, been in them. And that brings great joy. It's a pinnacle experience. However, you have to still come home and not be climbing pyramids and not be visiting Stonehenge, right? So you have to learn. I learned really quickly that anything can be approached as a mindful, spiritual experience of sorts meaning that you can take that into business, you can take that into meetings, you can take that into teamwork, you can take that into what you do personally. I mean, photography for me started out as something I didn't even realize I was doing until I realized I was doing it, right? <clears throat> Painting took more study, more skill. So I didn't go to school for it, but I studied with some incredible teachers. Um, I think that answers your question, but I, I don't feel like there's any one moment that is better than the other. I mean, giving birth to my kids was pretty powerful. I mean, I still remember that, right? Uh, I, I have to find things that keep my enthusiasm. And if I can keep my enthusiasm about something, I'll show up and 100%. If I'm not enthusiastic about something, you'll know, <laughs> because it won't be the same kind of energetic exchange. Um, so we always have to figure out a way to navigate these mundane and extraordinary experiences, because you'll get bored. If you're always looking for adventure and excitement, if I'm always looking for the next pyramid to climb, if I'm always thinking about the next trip to take to go do this and that, maybe I'm not home and not present enough. So I have found that, you know, to be balanced is really the goal, you know, to be grounded and to be balanced in whatever it is that you do. And I, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of extraordinary things. And at this stage in my life, I look back and I say, well, knowing what I know now, if I had had the same knowledge base back then, I probably would have done things differently. However, I have what I have now because I went through those things. So in 20 years from now, will I wish I was 47 again and I could do this way? I don't know. I just try to take every moment I can in and be as present as I possibly can for it. Right. Sense? Yeah. I, I think that's very important. Um, you, you, you touched on two things, being present and also enjoying and having fun in that moment. And I always tell this to my clients is that you really need to, you really need to enjoy what you're doing and have fun while you're doing it. And it sounds like you have really done that. And I, you know, I commend you on that. Here's, here's an interesting um, take on this is that it seems like your journey, again, I, I say this all the time with you right now, is that your journey has really come to this point in your life. And um, would you, if you were thinking about, let's just take photography, photography for, for um, yeah, let's take photography right now just for, you know, it's kind of a really neat uh, profession. A lot of people do it and a lot of people do it differently, but it seems like you do it in the way that makes sense for your, for what you do in life. 
and you know like you're meditating oh look i can take a picture here or you're you're you know in your office oh look i can take a picture here or i'm out in nature and and that's where you really thrive so my question would be is if you were talking to somebody right now um, and who like kind of like idolizes photography and being a photographer, what is probably one myth that you could probably debunk that, you know, that people think about photographers? They're artists. They're not photographers. They're artists. And they don't even realize they're artists. Okay. And here's the difference. The difference between being an artist and a photographer is as a photographer, it's about your eye, right? It's about what catches your eye. It's about lighting, it's about composition, it's about knowing your tools and, and being flexible and working. I know some photographers that have a really hard time admitting that they're artists, and a lot of artists that have a hard time admitting photographers are artists. So there's this conception, this belief that artists aren't photographers, and photographers are on their own little island, and that's what they do. They just have cameras with them all the time, and that's what they do. And they go through thousands and thousands of pictures to find the one. Well, I approach it differently because I'm an artist looking to make art. So immediately, my intention when I go out on a shoot isn't to find the most beautiful picture because everybody's looking for a beautiful picture. Beauty is one of these things where we can sometimes see it and sometimes reject it. So beauty is in the eye of the beholder, literally. And beauty can be something different to each person. So what I might think is beautiful might be completely outrageous to somebody else, right? Um, I don't like to photograph people. I just had a review done uh, a couple days ago with a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer. So he went through a portfolio of mine and, and we went through each photo and he critiqued it and, and gave me some feedback and stuff, which was one of the most valuable things ever to hear from somebody who's such a master at the craft, mm -hmm. what they think about your work. And it takes a lot of confidence to put your work in front of somebody like that and just sit down and listen to the feedback, positive or negative, right? Um, Photography has taught me to be more open and more flexible and not care so much about what people think about my shots. I, when I put a shot out there for show, I think of it more as an art piece, more than I think of it as a photograph, even though photograph is the medium, right? And when I take a photograph, I consider well, could I paint this? Is this something I might want to paint down the road? And, and so it's a real flip-flop for me. There's, there's no gray, it's not a gray area. It's one or the other. I'm going, to, I'm going to do one or the other, and I'm going to do something with it. So photography has um, given me an opportunity to really grow in ways I wasn't expecting either because I've won some awards. I, I've, had, I've put my work out there, and it's always a scary thing for some artists to put their work out there to get public opinion. Public opinion is a scary thing, right? You never know what you're gonna get. Um, so art for me is more about flexibility and, sh and shifting into whatever it is in the moment that you're, that you're feeling coming out. I can take a photograph and, make, and it can be an abstract, and people will say, well, that's not a photograph. And then I have abstract artists who go, oh my God, it's the greatest thing ever. So I, I don't know, you can't do things for people. You have to do things for yourself and what makes you feel all giddy and happy, right? And that feeling can be a synchronicity. Synchronicity is one of the greatest things that I have ever learned to follow in my entire life, right? It's synchronistic that you and I are on the camera right now, right? It's synchronistic that we've met yeah. somehow, some way. Um, not everything is going to have some obvious reason and usually it takes a little investigating to find out what reason, what the reason is that you've crossed paths with somebody or you've had an opportunity land in your, in your field. And what's the synchronicity of being an artist? Well, the synchronicity for me is that I get to go out there and anything I find, I stay open to the fact that I will find exactly what I need for the day. That there's some reason why I'm going out. I'm never disappointed. If I take one photograph or a hundred photographs, I'm never disappointed. I always find something that comes out of the shoot. 
And uh, one way or the other, I'm using it for something that makes me feel really happy and positive. And if I feel something, I get, you know, chicken skin or I get that gut feeling that I have a good shot, I'll know right away and I'll put it out there. And sure enough, it, it gets acknowledgement from something. So I don't know if I really answered your question, but that's kind of what came out. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and it just triggered something else in me. It's like, so, you know, when you're thinking of that ultimate photo shoot, you know, I, I've had this cause I, I do a lot of photography too, but one of the things that has always been on my mind, especially when I went on safari in Africa was what is that one shot that I want to get? You know, so have you ever been in the hunt for that one shot? What is it? Have you gotten it? And or you, are you still searching for it? Well, I don't know if I go out thinking that. I've never been conscious of, well, I'm going to get this one shot. I've gone to places where I've said, ooh, I can't wait to get there. But here's the thing. Being an artist means you have to find something different that everybody's going to take that one shot of the Eiffel Tower, right? You know, that one place where we all congregate, we all get off the bus and we're walking towards it, and we're all getting the same picture. How can you make your picture different from everybody else's picture? So the first thing I do when I arrive on a location period is, is get my head straight into unstraightness, if that makes any sense. And meaning, don't just go for eye level, I learned this too. This was something I discovered about myself is that most of my shots are eye level. I'm very tall. So I'm usually taller than everybody else in the group, right? So I'm getting my shots above the heads of everybody else. However, that's not good enough. You have to, being an artist and being successful at art means that you have to find a way to make your work unique and different than everybody else's. Well, that's not so easy sometimes. If I go, for example, being on uh, Giza Plateau, taking pictures of the pyramids, lots of opportunity for unique shots there. All you have to do is walk to where the tourists aren't and figure out ways to show, shoot angles and, and different perspectives. I like to shoot into the sun because I enjoy the sun, the way the sun reflects in my shots. Uh, there are some photographers who will tell you that is a big no-no. You never do that. You never shoot into the sun for a million reasons. But I don't follow those rules. So when I go on to it, one of the fun things I did recently <clears throat> was I went to Seattle and I was going out there to shoot the world's largest crystal collection to size in the world. It's a privately owned collection by a friend of mine who had invited me to come and, and shoot the Fontainebleau concretions. The Fontainebleau concretions are these magnificent natural sculptures from ancient ocean and sand and primal forces. These things are probably the size of a car, and you can spend hours getting into them with different, different angles and different composition. It's just amazing. Those were one of my favorite things to photograph. And my photographs of that collection have gone all the way to like the Salmagundi Club in New York. They have been put on show. People just don't even know why they love them. They don't even know what they're looking at most of the time until they read the description of the photograph, but they just know that they are compelled to figure it out. Well, I learned that that has to do with the eye. Your eye will behold an image subconsciously before you're even conscious. And you may look at something and go, I don't know why I can't stop staring at this. I don't even know why I like this, but I have something in you is compelled to figure it out. And that has to do with the eye. So when I started to shoot, for the complexities that the eye can pick up subconsciously before the viewer picks it up. I'm very aware of engaging the viewer in my artwork. And what I hope is to capture them momentarily, maybe linger a little longer, to look into my work to try to figure it out. Mm. So a lot of my work being abstract or being complex in the composition has to do with just that. And, um, I have found that to be one of the most challenging, beautiful ways to motivate myself in going on any location. I can go to the mall and find a shot and not have any people in it. 
I can go to uh, our nature preserves and, and I know where everybody's taking the regular photographs because you, they all stop at the little stops with the sign and they take the photographs and, and all the commonalities that they all, everybody does. So you have to find different things to take pictures of. So I have spent a long time practicing that craft and I feel like it has paid off in my career and I'm grateful for that. And so when I meet new photographers that maybe are excellent at shooting like babies or people or weddings, I always say, they always say to me, well, what you do feels more like art and what I do feels more like a job. And I say, well, you have to figure out how to make the art in your job. You have to figure out how to angle your shots and make them so creative and different that people would not recognize them as traditional wedding shots, right? I don't know. I, I think you just have to be really flexible. Going on shoot has um, its opportunities and no matter where you are, whatever you have on you to capture an image is what's meant to be captured. Something has to inspire you and move you enough to pick up any camera to take a picture of anything, right? Yeah. Wow. Um, I love, I love what you said. Actually, you inspired me. <laughs> it's awesome. So my question to you, what would you say is your biggest, probably your biggest accomplishment that you're most proud of? Cause it seems like you have a lot of accomplishments. What are you most proud of? My kids. Oh, I mean, really, I, I have adult children. I feel like I've accomplished, I've raised them to adults. And when I look around my life, sure, I mean, I've done some, some really great things uh, work-wise, of course. And, uh, but at the end of the day, what really matters and what really is important is being able to look at your grown children and be proud and happy of the choices they're making and the things that they're choosing to do and how they're doing it and how they're inspired to do it. You, you start to see something, I think, when you get to this stage that you don't necessarily see when you're, when you're raising them because now it's not so much about your boundaries and parameters and your parental techniques and styles. It's more about, well, they have the foundation that you've laid. So now you get to start seeing all the mirrored back to you things. And sometimes those mirrored back to you things are like, whoa, did I really teach them that? And you go and cry for an hour because it's sad, right? I have not learned as much as I have learned as a mom of adult children anywhere. So my greatest accomplishment is growing them in my belly for nine months and giving birth to them and being able to raise them and look back at them as young men and say, wow. We did it, right? We did it. So I, and I'm still learning it. And so parenting for me has been one of the most drastic and far reaching teachers. And I've worked with some phenomenal teachers in my life it, throughout my career, spiritually wise and also like uh, in art. And still the lessons that come at me now from my, my grown kids is like, how else would you ever learn that? How else could you ever get that mirror that you have now watching them be what you've raised, right? Be what you've raised. And no matter how, um, how active you are as a parent, I know not everybody has that opportunity to do that. But I was, a, I was able to stay home and raise my kids early on from, from young age to a decent age. And so I know not everybody has that opportunity to do that. Um, I felt at the time that it was one of the most challenging things because suddenly it's not about you at all. It's about them and you have to just adapt and you have no room for <laughs> getting out of that. You either adapt or you don't, right? And so I think my greatest accomplishment has been raising my kids to adulthood. I feel accomplished. When I say I have grown children, I'm proud of that because I did it. It's 20 years of a commitment, basically, right? Because once they get into their 20s, eh, your parenting is different. You're, you, have to, you have to parent differently when they're older. And I think too many people let their kids go when they turn 18. Oh, you're an adult now. See ya. Get out. Go. They don't. They need, the, they need some supportive 
guidance through those very important formative years. And I've been very happy that my sons and I have good relationship and that they're open to listening to me most of the time. And I know when they're not. So I just stop. Mm. I mean, that's a whole nother show. I mean, parenting is a really big deal. And I think right now with this whole thing going on, being stuck at home, you know, and not being able to really go about your daily routines the way you used to. You have to come up with a new routine. And this includes your children that may be back home. Your, your adult children, may, mine are home. And it's a different experience because, well, I mean, let's face it. You go about your life. You have your life. You do your routine. You do you. Your kids are off to school or out on their own. They're doing their own thing. Then they come back and you're like, whoa. <laughs> what's going on here and you have to be flexible more than ever so um, the biggest accomplishment I've ever done is, is learn how to be a parent to grown kids mm. yeah I'm, I'm learning I'm learning that. That. <laughs> yeah a lot of us are learning that now I find it interesting that when you scroll through you know the Facebook feed you're you're seeing all these parents of young children now like they they don't know what to do so it's a whole different, you know, it's a whole different life for everybody. Um, you're very inspirational. And if there was one thing that you would like your listeners to know that, you know, you think is actually the most important thing in life that you don't want them to miss, what would that be? Don't talk to people like you're talking to an audience. Mm. I, have, I have spent the last 15 years of my life very aware of my audience. As a broadcaster, that you have to be. Your audience is your, your well-being. It's your, you need it. If you don't have an audience as a broadcaster, you're just talking to the air. You're just talking to the ethers, right? I um, think people need to be more connective. And in the bloom of social media, social media is relatively new. It didn't really pop on the scene until about 2008. Interestingly enough, the same time Bitcoin came out. And we have watched since then a sort of resorting of what it means to be social and how it means to interact with each other. And people forget that when they're on social media, you are talking to an audience. You're talking to the people that are on your Facebook page. Everybody can see it. There is no private conversation on your wall. <laughs> there is none. Anything you put out is going to be put in front of, and this has to do with, you know, when they introduced their news feed, when they introduced all that, suddenly they had a completely different paradigm when they introduced the news feed. And what that meant was people didn't have to necessarily go to each individual person's page to check out what's going on. Suddenly what you're doing is right there in front of everybody, constantly breaking news, constantly, constantly. So when people go on to social media and they think this is connecting, I mean, it is to some degree, it's connecting. However, the average person doesn't realize that what they're doing is they're talking to an audience. It's an audience talk that you're having on Facebook. It's not a rant. It's not, a, it's not something that you, is just between you and another person. Nobody's speaking to you through their Facebook page. It really is this created this strange language that happens between people or assumptions. And, and there's so much misunderstanding most of the time that what that creates is what we're seeing now, this kind of duality of who believes what, who agrees with who. And more importantly, this, this thing that, that happens when you don't agree with somebody, you know, unblocking, you know, block, delete. It, I think we've become really careless with people's feelings in some way at the same time, right? Because not everybody can be understood in the full force of what they're intending in a comment that's typed, right? You and I are connecting here on video. I see your face. I hear your voice. You know, it's not quite the same thing as being in the same room, but it's a whole lot better than me and you just typing comments and trying to engage that way. There's more to it. Human beings are not meant to be isolated for too long. I mean, there's been studies done where babies that aren't given the, the touch and the holding and the caring and the bonding early on develop very differently than babies who are. So that said, most of us are uh, hardwired 
to have human connection, touch, eyes, uh, you know, seeing things, feeling things. We're sensory beings. We have to be able to interact that way. Um, so I would tell people, remember that human connection is really important and that when you are on social media, you're not really connecting one-on-one -on -one with people. You're connecting to an audience. And when we do, when we realize that, make that shift, as a broadcaster, I'm always aware of that. If I wasn't a broadcaster, I might not be so aware of that. So I might be in that group that I'm talking to right now, is that you just have to remember to be real and authentic in your interactions, no matter what. But there's limitations to those interactions. And we have to remember that hearing the voice triggers something in our brain that we don't get with typed comments. Does that make sense? Does it, yeah. Yeah, people read in between the lines all the time, and that's why you get so many, you know, you'll get these little Facebook wars going on, and, you know, I try to stay out of them, but um, you, connection is so big, and I, I can see how you're connected to a lot of things in your life, and, and just even your viewpoints are just amazing. What do you think? What what it, what do you think you'll be doing five years from now? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. So you you're more you definitely live in the moment then. Well, I have to live in the moment, and I like living. In, I'm enthusiastic about living in the moment. Synchronicity is in the moment, right? But having a five year plan is important, and I learned this in business, and I think this is something we can create balance with. So if we have a plan, you know, five years, where do I want to be? How many more, you know, do I want to write more books? Do I want to be teaching art? Do I want to be, what do I want to be? I have to sit down with that. I don't know. I, I, this moment is a reset and it's an opportunity for everybody to take a look at what they're doing, where their passions are, because everything is canceled. You're not missing out on anything. Isn't it great? You have all this time and energy. Nothing's going on out there that you're missing. You can create it all right here. And how beautiful is that? And my mother is a uh, sewer. She sews. You know, she creates arts and crafts stuff. So she was feeling very depressed. I'm just going to share this story with you. This kind of tells you what I'm talking about here. She's feeling a little overwhelmed. She's a former retired nurse. So she was really scared about what was going on. And she had the TV going all day long on the breaking news, ah! So the first thing I did when I went to visit her was to turn her TV off and say, stop it. And then take a deep breath for God's sake, woman, and just breathe, and so she did. And I said, mom, how about doing a craft fair? You've never done a craft fair. Well, I know, and she sews and sews, and she has a whole room filled with things she's made. I said, you have the inventory, you can make some money, why not? So she signed up for a craft fair, and she's, she sends me pictures now, every single scarf and hat she's finished, and she's, so, and she's completely changed the trajectory of where her thought patterns were going. We have to remember that in order to be sane, we do need some isolation from constant information. We are living in a digital age where constant information is at every access point that we have. We can connect to it. It doesn't have to be TV. It can be phone, which we all have, uh, device, computer, wherever, right? Get our news from social media, wherever we get our news from. We're just constantly bombarded with information. And our brains are great at processing information. However, the rest of our systems aren't used to being on a breaking news moment by moment by moment by moment. So we have to step back and say, well, how can I just tune in when I need to, get what I need, and step out of it. And what am I going to do when I step out of it? Well, you have to figure that out. That's part of what you're doing. And it's part of the necessity to being able to find the opportunity in a crisis. Crisis is nothing more than the, than the opportunity to figure out how well your skills are when it comes to crisis management, right? If you run a business, you have to figure out, well, what parts of my business are affected now? Which ones can I live without? How can I restructure? Do I have a plan? Those kind of things are really opportunistic moments for that to happen. So like when my mother found out she could have something more positive to focus on, it's like that for all of us. We can find something positive to focus on. We create our own routines. We're not missing out on anything. 
we have to create our own realities. Isn't that what we've been told from a spiritual perspective by everybody, whether it's, you know, wherever you get your inspiration from, um, it's pretty consistent message. So I think as long as we're busy building something that inspires us for God's sake, if it doesn't inspire you, don't do it, do something else. How simple is that? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, there's a book out there, um, was written years ago, um, about a man that was in a concentra concentration camp, Victor Frankl, it was called the meaning of life. And, um, what got him, you know, he was in isolation and, and just in prison and away from his family, away from his work. And literally what kept him going was thinking of his family and thinking of his work. You know, and I think that you share that, you shared that with your mom. It's like, look, you're doing all this amazing stuff, mom. You can do something with it instead of watching news all day. And because watching news all day isn't going to get us through life. Um, are you work, currently working, I'm going to wrap this up now. Are you currently working on any new projects as we talk? New projects. Well, I'm doing a new series of Zoom talks. And I have discovered this fabulous tool of homework <laughs> and it's really helping me to create, I create, I've created community meetings open to everybody anywhere where we, we don't record it. It's nothing, it's not a formal production or anything. We just get on zoom as a group of people and we just really ask for what we need. Mm -hmm. um, support is a really interesting concept when you take away the production, right? You, how do you support each other in a non-productive kind of way? Well, you just get together like a bunch of girlfriends and your, you know, friends and you talk and you, you have conversations and you laugh and you cry and you realize things about yourself. And so I've been doing community meetings and I, I've also started a series of Zoom talks that are more direction, you know, more specific and, based on different concepts that I find myself enthusiastic about talking about. And, um, you know, I've been on uh, terrestrial radio for so long. I was also on internet radio for a long time. And now Zoom gives me the opportunity to interview people and not have to leave the comfort of my own home or have a big production to do about it. It's very simple. You just get on, you have a conversation like this and put it out to the world and hopefully it helps and, inspire somebody somewhere to live a happier life. And really that's what it's all about. I'm, I'm creating content. I've been a content maker since 2005. Well, what does that mean? Well, it just means I put things together and put it out there. I was on YouTube before most people were and, and uh, social media didn't come in until later on. So social media was an additional add on to getting content out there. Now we see what a mess that's become. And, um, so here I am. I, I'm just doing what I, what I want to do and how I feel like doing it. And I feel a bit retired sometimes because I don't feel like I'm doing it on such a level that I was doing it before, meaning busy, right? Not busy the way I was before. I think we're finding that. Busyness is something we can live without. We can do things in a different order that doesn't create such chaotic energy or busy. Busy is not necessarily always so good. Because being on the go, 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 go isn't good for humans. Mm. I just think we need to re rethink how we create and how we do it and the energy that we do it in. And, you know, my, my job and my purpose is not necessarily the same as other people's. Everybody's got their own purpose and their own uh, gift to give. And mine happens to be in production and doing these kind of things. So... I feel that I'm aligned with that already. And, I, and I'm lucky that at my age, I have already found that. I found it at a young age. So I was able to really focus my, my attention on what I was doing because I wasn't questioning everything or questioning what I was doing. Is this really what I want to be doing? If I even ask myself that question now, I don't do it. I reevaluate immediately because if I start to feel, ugh, which is what broadcasting was doing for me for a bit. Because I, how many books can you possibly talk about? <laughs> I wanted to have real conversations, Lorraine. I wanted to have interactive discussions, like kind of what you and I have been doing. This is, 
this isn't just me talking about my work all the time. It's, it's, in, it's um, interesting. It's dynamic. It, you give some input. I give some input. We talk back and forth. It's conversational. And I think people really just need more of that now. They need more real, authentic stuff, content. I don't know. Instead of the production of everything. It's, it, I've become disenchanted with the production of everything. But I know production is important, necessary to do what I do. So how can I be unhappy with part of what I do? Well, then don't do it. I didn't do it for a year or two. I... I was doing guest spots on different networks in Europe and in Ireland and in the United States. And it was fun and it was interesting. However, it was still the same kind of things, books, people. It was like, I could just, I could fall asleep and do the whole show autopilot <laughs> because it was the same thing. Right. And then when I went back on the air, I went back on FM radio in Los Angeles and I had a live spot. I didn't pre-record my shows. I really wanted to just do live radio and just bypass and skip over the whole production aspect of it. Just do a live show. That's it. One chance. And that worked better for me doing that for six months. And so now I think I'm just going to do zoom and I'm going to see where it goes. I don't know. Yeah, and, and you can have fun doing it. Um, so if there was one, if there was, uh, I'm going to end this here. It's like, what can, you know, your listeners right now, if they wanted to get in touch with you or support you in any way, how would they do that? Well, you can go to my website, hillaryremo.com. I also have an active Twitter and Facebook page. You can find me on there. And uh, I do have a website on WordPress, which is more updated more frequently. And it's more about my artwork and stuff. So they can find me on WordPress. And all of those links are on my website at hillaryremo.com. Awesome. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, everybody.